All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Two little girls this morning, Mary Ann and London, right, Mary Ann? That's right. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Dusty. Good morning, Mr. Dominic. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, London. Yeah, this is the cute part of the service, right? <laughs> these, are, these are the awe moments. And, and of course, you know, um, or maybe you don't, but we, we model this after Jesus being dedicated in, in the temple. And, and they're taken into uh, to, be, to be prayed over, to be, to be blessed. And, and in that moment, it was a, it was a prophetic moment, and it was, a, it was a divine appointment moment. And we see that, that there in that moment, the understanding that, that the Messiah the recognition that the Messiah was, he was literally holding the Messiah in his hands. And, and he had lived to that point, and he was ready to go. He had met, he'd met the Messiah. And so this morning, we, we dedicate a child, but we also recognize that as we, as we come along to dedicate, that you are extended family. Because you know what? I don't know if you've noticed yet, but children aren't perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the adults that are raising them aren't perfect either. Let's just be honest about that, right? But we want to have a loving, nurturing environment as a church. Uh, there's a lot of ways to turn a child off from the Lord. We want to be at a place where, where children feel comfortable to discover the Lord and to know the Lord as their, the, as their Savior and, and to come alongside. And there's a, uh, there's a body of believers that live that, that demonstrate that. And so you are that body. So that is your task today. That is your opportunity to to minister to families as we uh, present them to the Lord this morning. So, uh, Dustin and Sarah, we're going to start with Marianne this morning. How old is Marianne now? 14 weeks. Oh, you are, oh, my hands are cold. I'm sorry, sweetheart. She gave me that look like, cold hands, cold hands. All right, we're just going to show her off a little bit this morning. We're going to come this way. She's got eyes for somebody over there, right? Good morning, everybody over here. Good morning, good morning. Some of you are thinking, man, we could have another one. <laughs> Others of you are rebuking that spirit right now, saying, no, we are not. We are not having another one. Let's just enjoy everybody else's, right? So there, there we go. This is Marianne. All right. And this is mom and, uh, mom and dad. Dustin and Sarah this morning, and you guys have been coming for a couple years now, and we're thrilled to have you here this morning. So we're going to pray with you. Don is going to lay hands of Collins. What a great middle name. Lord, we thank you today. Church, would you just be praying with us? And maybe you even want to stretch out a hand just in, in support today and love. Lord, we thank you today for Dusty and Sarah and for Marianne Collins Bentley. Lord, we just know that... Uh, that this, these are, are those divine moments. These are moments in our life that we never forget. And Father, I pray that we would just be reminded, much like the ring that is on our finger that symbolizes a, a covenant and, and, a, and a marriage and a, and, and a faithfulness to each other, but this would be a moment where we, we made a covenant before our friends and family, our church, and certainly before you, that we would be moms and dads that would, would love you and would model Jesus to our kids. As, uh, as we know, Lord, our, we as parents are the, really the first Jesus that, that the kids will meet. We model that in the home. And so, Lord, I pray that they would model. And, Lord, for her, she would grow up to be a mighty woman of God. And that, Lord, she would be someone that just has a passion for the things of Christ. And she would know from a very early age what it is to serve Jesus. And that, Lord, that you would make her path straight. And, Lord, that she would just have your, um, just your love and grace all over her life. We pray this in Jesus' name today. Amen, amen, amen. Wow, were you just great today. Weren't you just fantastic? All right. She loves coming to church. Very good. Fantastic. All right, baby London. And how old's London now? Five whole months? Is it possible? I know, cold hands. I know, I tried to get him warmed up. I'm going to let you see mom and dad, okay? So you can see mom and dad. And there's big brother just looking at everything else, not paying any attention. There we go. All right, so here is London this morning. And she's ready for you. 
you'll note that Jessica actually has a smaller bow. Uh, oftentimes, uh, London would come to church with a bow larger than her head. And uh, so today, picture day, a little smaller bowl, a uh, bowl, a little smaller bow, all right? Do you see everybody over there this morning? See some nice faces that want to see you today? You see some faces that want to see you? Lots of smiles out there. It's pretty hard not to smile back at a baby, right? You know what's fun for me is watching you make all the funny faces at babies. I'm enjoying that just as much this morning. You are being fantastic, too. I'm having a good morning here today. All right. Well, Nick and Jess and Dom, this is really great. We get to pray for for London. You ready? Let's pray together. All right. Lord, we thank you. This is, again, another family moment. We come together, and and, uh, Lord, for for Nick and Jessica and and for Dominic, Lord, they, they, they know the responsibility, and and Dominic's growing into that responsibility. But Lord, these are the opportunities that we have today as, as church family to come alongside and recognize that we're not alone in this and that in the things of God, that uh, we can know divine provision, we can know divine direction. And we pray, Lord, for, for London today, who's making funny faces at her brother right now. But that, uh, that, that enthusiasm would grow into the, to a, a passion for Jesus. And Lord, may she follow Jesus all her life. May she know you early and forever. And may she just go in that way. And for, for Nick and Jessica, Lord, as, uh, as leaders here in our church, that Lord, that your ongoing grace. It's, um, it's interesting growing up as a PK. And Lord, I just ask that uh, that special just uh, sense of uh, wisdom that uh, all, all PKs need and, 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 and pastors need for their kids. In Jesus' name, we pray it. Amen. Amen. All right. You were having a good time, weren't you? All right. All right. Good deal. All right. You were fantastic for me today, weren't you? You're trying to preach? Well, there we go. Fantastic. All right. Well, as they head that way, kids, I want to pray with you before you go off to kids' church this morning. So come on down. Let's see right here at the front. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Let's see you. Good morning. How are you? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good to see you. Good morning, good morning. How is everybody? Hey, Dominic, good to see you again. All right, oh, you're going to sit right there, are you? All right, you want to turn around, sit the other way so everyone can see you too? All right, good morning, Caitlin. Good morning, you sit on right down. Very good. All right, look at all these great-looking kids, right? Fantastic. All right, kids, you ready to pray? Big kids, you ready to pray out there too? That means you adults, all right? So uh, let's all pray together. Here we go. Dear Jesus, thanks for a great day. You're in it. We know it. And help us to live in its potential. Bless our kids' church. And bless our not-so-big kids' church. <laughs> in Jesus' name. And everybody said, goodbye, boys and girls. Off we go up those one of those two aisles. We'll see you later. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. All right. That's the wrong way. That's the wrong way. All right. Off you go, sweetheart. All right. Come on, this guys. We're going this way. We're going that way. Fantastic. Thank you, David. All right, all right. I want to make sure I am on task. Grab my service order. Thank you. I don't know if you've noticed, but kids never go quietly, right? They never go to their room quietly. They never do anything quietly, but that's just great. We enjoy the kids being in here and... uh, This little thing we started at the beginning of, I think, summertime in September, we're enjoying, and so we're just going to do it for a while longer, all right? It's important to pray with our kids, and there we go. All right, I was was contemplating where we were about a year ago, and um, just kind of working through in my brain all the the, the amazing things that the Lord has done in this this body in the last year. and I don't know if you remember, but about a year ago, we, we had this challenge that came out of the, uh, the Blessed Life series. And 
Uh, we had given that book out to everyone that was here at the time, and we asked you to read, and we took a kind of a four-month look at um, how God uh, wants to partner with us, and, and he's calling us to partner with him, and, and we, we got a firm foundation in regards to tithe, and we had a greater understanding of what it means to, uh, to give and, and to do in offerings, but also in those steps of faith to uh, sometimes even go to those places where it hurts a little bit. To, to give because he is calling us to give. He's, he is, he's really pushing us that way. And, and as I was thinking through that, that the, everything that had happened last year, I, I came across a passage in Paul's writings to the church in Corinth. And, and uh, remarkably, and I shouldn't be surprised, but his thoughts, uh, boy, as I was reading them, I went, man, it was so applicable to us today. And so as your pastor, I want to read it to you. Uh, with that backdrop in mind. And uh, I've chosen the message sec- uh, to read 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and these, these several verses to you. It's coming up on the screen this morning, because most of you are not carrying the message with you today. But here it is. It says, Now I want to tell you what God in His grace has done for the churches in Macedonia. Though they have been going through much trouble and hard times, they have mixed their wonderful joy with their deep poverty. And the result has been an overflow of giving to others. They gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And I can testify that they did it because they wanted to, and not because of nagging on my part. They begged us to take the money so they could share in the joy of helping the, joy of helping the Christians in Jerusalem. Best of all, They went beyond our highest hopes, for their first action was to dedicate themselves to the Lord and to us, and for whatever directions God might give them through us. They were so enthusiastic about it that we we have urged Titus, who who encouraged your giving in the first place, to visit and encourage you to complete your share in this ministry giving. You people there are, are, are leaders in so many ways. You have so much faith. So many good preachers, so much learning, so much enthusiasm, so much love for us. Now, I want you to be leaders also in the spirit of cheerful giving. We've talked about this, haven't we? Right? I am not giving you an order. I'm not saying you must do it, but others. Others are eager for it. This is one way to prove that your love is real, that it goes beyond mere words. You know how much love or how full of love and kindness our Lord Jesus was. Though he was so very rich, yet to help you he became so very poor, so that by being poor he could make you rich. And here's the part out of this passage that I just, I want to just, well, this is what got me. Paul continues and says, I want to suggest that you finish what you started to do a year ago. And that just struck me. A year ago everything changed. And we started down a path where we started to understand in a greater way what it is to, to, to know God's blessing in our lives. Challenged you for a 90-day period to, to give and, 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 and to test the Lord in that regard. And, 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 and many of you walk that way. Others today are going, well, that was a good 90 days, but I've taken it back. And... Um, but Paul's saying here, I, I want to suggest that you finish what you have started to do a year ago. For you were not only the first to, to, to propose this idea, but the first to begin doing something about it. Having started the ball rolling so enthusiastically, you should carry this project through to completion just as gladly. Giving whatever you can out of whatever you have. What your enthusiastic idea at the start, be equaled by your realistic action now. If you are really eager to give, then it isn't important how much you give. God wants you to give what you have, not what you haven't. Friends, as I read that, I just went, man, I can't wait to share that on Sunday with our folks. And so with that in mind, um, I'm just reminded that he's promised to do it. And if we will come alongside and live in his promises... And accept in faith that which he has challenged us to do in in regards to our finances, resources, and all those things. Then uh, we will genuinely understand what it means to live a blessed life. If you're at the end of the aisle, if you'd reach down and grab that bucket this morning. We are going to receive our morning tithe and offering today. 
And before we pass it, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you this morning for every dollar and for every dime. And Lord, thank you for that passage. Thank you for directing us that way today, so timely. A reminder of what has happened in this past year. So many stories of, of, of provision and, and miraculous, just uh, uh, God, you're providing in situations. And for others, just the whew, steps of faith to, to continue to do that. And, and Lord, sometimes we're just so, we just want to take it all back because that's our nature. Just control it all. But Lord, as we said, we want more of you today. And Lord, even in what we do with our finances, we release that and we give you priority in all these things. So God, we thank you as we receive these tithes and offerings today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As that is being passed, we have a very special uh, video on Operation Christmas Child. All right? God bless you. Christmas. Operation Christmas Child is one of the great stories that's unfolding in our lifetime. I want the children of the world to know, I want their parents to know that God loves them and he wants them to be with him in heaven. That's what it's all about. Every single box is important because it connects to hearts. The heart of the person who pocks the box and the heart who is in need of that love. When I look at these boxes, I just see thousands of smiling kids. I think it's an awesome opportunity to change the world. We have led the children from the box to the Bible. We developed The Greatest Journey, a 12-week discipleship program for the kids that make decisions for Christ. Yo les voy a compartir lo que aprendí a mis amigas, a mi papá y a mi mamá. I am so excited that I'm part of a ministry that is so huge. Thank you. This is just so awesome to give these children the opportunity to experience the love of Christ in a way that they've never experienced before in their lives. We are only seeing just the beginning of this project. Because the Lord, He's got something that is beyond our imagination. Into the millions and into the billions. And these children will change the world. These are kids that have nothing. These gifts will mean everything in the world to these children. And we're going to give them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yay. I'm Linda Miller. I'm doing your not video announcements this morning. And um, just so you know, when you came in, we have these. Connection cards on the back is all of the different things that are happening this week, but I want to highlight some of the things. First of all, Samaritan's Purse. What an amazing opportunity to open the door to teach kids about who Jesus is. You're giving gifts for birthday presents for Jesus, and they go, who is he? What an awesome, awesome opportunity. So when you go out into the foyer, you'll see that there are these green sheets. Today is the first day. This is week one. You can give what is today, or you can give that next week or whatever. But we're giving a little bit at a time, so we will have enough to fill those boxes, and then we will do the boxes, and we'll have a, we'll have a wrapping party. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, so this week it is tape. It is Ziploc bags of all sizes, and it is wrapping paper. Drop your items off in the foyer. Also, number two, I love my church work day. Yay! Come on. I know. Nobody, nobody likes to work, but everybody likes to have a free breakfast, right? So if you come here Saturday at 7 a.m., you get a free breakfast, but you got to stay for working. But it's okay because, because we'll be here, and it'll be fun, and you'll have a good time, and we'll get a chance to clean up in our community as well. What a great opportunity to show who Jesus is and how much he loves, right? Okay, number three. 
Life After 50, LAF, L-A-F. Their banquet is this Friday. If you are 50 or older, you are invited to attend. Please go out to the gazebo, and it is $6, a deal at any price. They always have great entertainment, get an opportunity. We have about 100 people that come every month. Isn't that right? What a, what a great opportunity to mix and mingle, get to know people. Life After 50, this Friday, please go out to the gazebo and get your tickets. This month is October. That's pretty crazy, huh? But you know what October is? It is Pastor's Appreciation Month. Don't tell the pastors you know that, but write them a note. Write them a note of encouragement. Give them a card. You can give a gift if you want to. We are going to have a box out in the foyer over the next couple of weeks where you can nicely and neatly and discreetly just, just put it in there, and, and we will make sure that the pastors that you want to love on and honor are going to get those cards and those, those, those letters of encouragement. Okay? <laughs> and finally, number five, every nine seconds in this country, domestic violence occurs. Isn't that horrible? Every nine seconds. That's horrible. But we can do something about it. And part of what we can do about it, we have a, there's an organization actually called Every Nine Seconds, and we support them because they come out, they, we, the, the founder of that is from our church here. And she takes care of people who are victims of domestic abuse. The way to support that is to be part of their 5K walk, run, crawl, depending on what you do best. But we are asking for you to meet, meet Brenda out at the gazebo. She will give you more information. You get sponsors. You show up. The uh, 5K is October 25th this month. Please participate. Thank you so much. God bless. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? We have a few more announcements. Don't you just love announcements, right? It's the, the funnest thing in the world. Um, hey, we, we've got a, an announcement. We are doing a missions trip in June, and we would love for all of you to be a part of this. We're taking a missions trip to Rome, Italy, and uh, we will be getting some more information out to you in the next few weeks, but we would encourage you uh, on your connection card today, um, just make a little line on there and mark it. I want more information about that. And um, Jessica's parents are actually missionaries over there at the International Church of Rome, and they are doing a tremendous work over there. And so we would like to come alongside them and help them out in, the, in a bunch of different ways. So I encourage you, write your name on there, and uh, we'll get some information. We'll get an informational meeting very soon, get prices, all those kind of things, and, and see how many of you would like to go. By the way, there's, there's really not an age restriction or anything on this. We're encouraging people to bring their families and uh, it's going to be an amazing opportunity. Um, one more announcement about the, the Operation Christmas Child. There's going to be information out there today. You can also see Steve and Joan Warnicke, and you can get information from them as well. All right, how many of you saw these beautifully, beautiful red papers you have? All right. If you take a look at this, it says 21 weeks to prepare. So a few months ago, we had a, a safety arc summit here, and basically it was about, are we prepared? Are we prepared for a disaster? You, you know, in those kind of situations, where are people going to go? They're going to go to a church first, right? Do we have water? Do we have any medical things here? But then it started getting us to think, well, what about you at home? Do you have what you need at home? Do you have copies of driver's license and birth certificates and important things? Do you have water to get you through a week or a day even? Do you have food? Do you have the basic necessities that you need? So I would encourage you, please use this. And it's just a simple tool. So each week, there's just a few things that you get here. And it costs about $1.75 a week if you were to get those things. And, and this will make sure by the end of, of 21 weeks that you have what you need to be prepared and to also to help, help your family out. Announcements are over. Everyone say amen. amen. All right. Hey, before I start today, I, I just want to say a, a very special welcome to uh, Pastor Robert and Gene Johnson over here. And um, they were my pastors growing up, so it's a big deal for me that they're here today. So, Pastor Jeff, thank you for the opportunity today to, uh, to be here and to share with you. All right. How many of you ever had a dog? Okay, how many of you are dog people? 
How many of you are cat people? Boo on the cat. Just kidding. <laughs> what kind of a dog did you have or have? All right, we got a lab. We got a golden retriever. What else? A Rottweiler. All right. Cocker Spaniel. A Chow. All right. When, when I was growing up, um, I had a, a white German Shepherd. That's pretty rare. I had a white German Shepherd and... Um, I guess I was trying to be super spiritual, and I named my dog Moses, and um, Moses was, like most German Shepherds, very protective. He, he patrolled our backyard. He owned it, you know, and he had, like, worn in the ground, like a path where he walks and makes sure everything is secure. Well, on the right side of our house, there, there was another really, really large dog, and, and Moses and the other dog did not get along. It was like barking at each other all the time, jumping at the fence, all those kind of things. We had a huge, huge storm, and it blew down part of our fence. Now, luckily, we saw this before the dogs got at each other, but I had to put my dog on a chain, right? I had to put my dog on a chain so to, to restrict him. Now, when you have a chain on something, it immobilizes you. It restricts, it, it, it holds back, and that's what I had to do so he would stay safe. Now, the reason I tell you this is because a lot of us, we live our lives with invisible chains, things that hold us back, things that restrict us from being who God really has. Today, what we're going to be talking about is how to break the chains, how to break the chains. Now, there are different kinds of issues that, that people deal with. Um, first of all, addiction. There are lots of kinds of different addiction. People think addiction is just alcohol or drugs or stuff like that. No, it can be food. It can be a lot of different things. Maybe another chain that, that people are carrying around today is, is a chain of hate or anger. Uh, maybe some chains that people are carrying around are, are financial issues, debt. What are we going to do? We're drowning in debt. Whatever the chain that you are carrying around today, I want you to know that there is power in Jesus to break those chains off. Amen? If you have your Bible, if you could open up to Acts chapter 12, please. I need to give you a little background information here. So Jesus had already come to the earth. He had died. He had resurrected. The Holy Spirit has been sent. The Holy Spirit has empowered the, the disciples and the followers they are going out and they are telling people about Jesus. Literally thousands of people are, are getting saved and, and this movement of Christianity is starting. Now, there were some people that were not happy about this. The, the, the Jewish people were not happy about this. The, the Roman people were not happy about this. And in fact, the, the king of Rome, he, he was not happy and he wanted to squash this thing and he wanted to, to maintain order and he wanted to gain favor with the Jewish people. So he started to go around and start identifying who these leaders of this movement were and trying to eliminate them. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. So here's the story. Peter's put in jail because he's telling people about Jesus. Simple as that. He's put in jail because he's telling people about Jesus. Now, did you catch that there were 16 guards for one prisoner? Did you catch, doesn't that seem a little bit overkill? 16 guards for one prisoner. The king, he wanted to squash this thing, and so he wanted to eliminate Peter. Verse 5. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Now, the first thing that you all need to know is that when you are trying to break off those chains in your life, is you have to pray. You have to pray. 
You see, we kind of live in a world now where it's like, well, you know, we want a program or, or, or we want something that's going to do the work for us. You see, if we're not willing to pray, those chains are never going to be broken off of our lives. It starts with prayer. So Peter is in jail, and what does it say the church is doing? They are praying very earnestly for him, earnestly. This language means that, that they were praying intensely, that they were, they were praying uh, very hot, with emotion, with passion. They were praying with a fervency and believing for something. Now, look, I know we pray about a lot of different things. When you're praying for a parking space at Walmart, that's not the kind of prayer I'm talking about. Okay, this is the prayer where your child's life is on the line or your loved one's life is on the line and you are praying in desperation. That is how the church is praying. They are praying with everything that they have because someone's life is on the line. Now, remember, the passage earlier said that James had already been executed. You see, the Christians didn't want another of their leaders to be executed. Verse 6, the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. So somehow, Peter is able to sleep. Maybe this is just the peace of God upon him, but he, he is able to sleep. But he says that he is chained to two guards. Now, the, the, the culture tells us that basically what it would be is one chain would be around this wrist, and then it would be chained to the guard over here. If you were really, really bad and a security threat, then they would put a chain on the other wrist and a guard on the other side. Now, remember, they had 16 guards around. So Peter is there. He's chained to these two uh, guards and he is sleeping he's sleeping now verse 7 suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter the angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said quick get up and the chains fell off his wrist then the angel told him get dressed and put on your sandals and he did now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter's asleep. This bright light comes out of nowhere, but somehow Peter's still asleep. Any of you hard sleepers? Like you sleep through earthquakes, right? So for whatever reason, he, he's able to be asleep. This bright light has come. He's, he's out cold. What I find so funny here is that the scripture says that this angel struck him. Did you catch that? Now, I've looked in, in, in the Greek and all that kind of stuff, and basically it means, like, he punched him. Like, I don't know if you got somebody that's the hard sleeper that you got to be like, wake up! But it reminds me of my son, Dominic, okay? So sometimes in the morning, he'll, he'll like, crawl into bed with me, and, and I've had times where he's, like, jumped on my head. Um, there's been times where he slapped me and be like, Dad, it's time to wake up. And then his, his one that he does a lot now is, Dad... Dad, it's morning time. It's morning time. Time to get up. So Peter's asleep. All of a sudden, he gets hit in the side, and this bright light is in front of him and saying, quick, get up, quick, get up. And then immediately the chains that he's attached to these guards fall off. The guards are still asleep somehow. And it says, okay, get up, get your clothes on, get your coat on, get your shoes on, let's go. Now, we fast forward this story here now does this sound like a dream a little bit sounds like a dream right I don't know if any of you've ever had a very vivid dream but this is what it sounds like Peter's just having this crazy dream and he's like, okay I'm gonna go along with this dream verse 9 so Peter left the cell following the angel but all the time he thought it was a vision he didn't realize it was actually happening they passed the first and second guard post and came to the iron gate leading to the city, and this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street, and then the angel suddenly left him. 
So Peter's kind of walking through these things and, and walking out of the, the prison first and then by the guard post, the next guard post, and then he's walking out of the gate, like just amazing stuff. It says the gate opened up by itself, like this is a really cool dream, right? Verse 11, Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter's standing at the door! Now, Peter goes to where, where these believers are, He's pounding on the door. This, this girl's like, hey, hey, we're, pray we're praying for you right now. Like, whoa. And she gets so excited that she leaves him outside and then like runs back and, and starts to tell everybody. Now, the first thing that you need to do to break chains is pray. The second thing that you need to do to break chains is have faith. Faith. Verse 15. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided, well, it must be his angel. Now, isn't this very ironic? These people are literally praying for Peter that God would somehow do something amazing, something miraculous. Peter is now standing at the gate. He's hitting the gate. Let me in. But somehow... They're struggling to believe what they prayed for can actually happen. This happens to us, right, where we go, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll pray for that person who's sick in their family. But in the back of your mind, you're kind of like, man, that doesn't look good. This is an impossible situation. Or that person who's drowning in debt, I'll pray for you. But in the back of your mind, you you don't really believe that it's possible. You see, they, then they said, well, you know, if something's out there, then maybe it's his ghost. Maybe it's his ghost, but it couldn't really be Peter. You see, it's so ironic. The very thing that they were praying for happens, and then they can't accept it. They can't have enough faith to believe that it actually is possible. Because you see, anything is possible for him who believes. Am I right? The scripture tells us that. You see, but oftentimes we live our lives and we pray for things, but we don't believe for things. And we go, well, that can't really happen. God's not able to do that, or he's at least not going to do it for me. So anyways, they tell this girl, you're out of your mind, you're crazy. Peter's outside still, hitting the gate. Open the gate! Open the gate! This is the middle of the night when this is happening. Verse 16. Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led them out of prison. Then he says, tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went on to another place. I told you earlier that, that we all walk around with chains they may be invisible chains, but we all have chains of some sort that we carry in our lives. I gave you a couple categories before. Addiction, I gave you financial issues, and, and I gave you hate. Now, a lot of times when we think of addiction, we, we think of things that are just like alcohol, those kind of things. But there are other things that are just as addicting that people walk around with. Here's one that I face a lot with teenagers. Video games. Video games. But did you know this is not just an issue for teenagers anymore? Then we get to something that the world says is a little bit more serious. This is, this is a real addiction, right? We got drugs. Now I'm going to make some of you mad, but that's okay. Social media. Some of you are addicted to social media. 
you can't go to the grocery store without posting it on Facebook, <laughs> putting it on Instagram, maybe doing a Snapchat while you're there, and just, just plastering social media. I don't care if you went to the grocery store. And we got another one here. Gambling. Gambling. You see, this is something that a lot of people struggle with. Well, I, I'm just going to play the game, and I'm going to make some money, and it's going to just solve all my problems and, and all of those things. Another addiction that, that people have, sports. Sports. If you are the person that has to DVR every single sports game that's out there, then you watch the game, then you watch the highlights of the game. Then you watch, like, the highlights of the highlights of the game. Like, you are constantly on your phone checking the scores, checking this, checking that. And, I mean, like, you, you just, you really struggle. You love sports. So I'm not saying sports are bad, but when you let it consume your life, anything can be bad. Then we get to something like alcohol. Alcohol. We live in a world that says, oh, it's okay, you can drink this, you can drink that, and, and it's becoming more and more prevalent. Well, we're just going to drink. That's going to solve all my problems. I'm just going to drink it away. Then here's a, another addiction. And this is one that Christians really struggle with. is food. Right? It seems like every function that we have at church, right, what is it around? Food. Right? Food. Or maybe it's something like this. Pornography. Pornography. Do you know that studies are showing that this is no longer just a problem for guys? It's almost as bad of a problem for ladies. Pornography is running rampant in our society. It's another thing that, that chains us down. Now let's go on to our financial issues, our financial chains. Any of you have one of these with a whole lot of money on that? Right? Credit cards. Credit cards where we have to have everything. Well, I'm just going to put that on the credit card. I'm just going to rack it up. I'll, you know, something that was $10, I'll end up paying $455 for that $10 item. But I got to have that item, right? Maybe you are drowning in debt. Now, I understand that a few years ago, the economy tanked. People lost homes. People lost jobs. I understand there was difficult times. Maybe you got all kinds of school loans. You got car payments, all these things. But you're drowning in debt. Or maybe you're the person that you struggle with self-image. Now, what do I mean by this? You're the person that you've got to have everything that everyone else has. If your neighbor got a new car, you want a new car. If they got the new iPhone 6, you're going to get the new iPhone 6. You're trying to keep up with the Joneses. Everything is a competition, even if you don't need it. You buy tools and things that you don't need just because someone else has it, and you go, that looks good, I want it. Now let's move on to our hate category. Unfortunately, we live in a world where prejudice still exists. Unfortunately, we live in a place where people look at people and they go, your skin color is different than mine. I don't like you. They think they're less of a person. You see, hate is something that divides. Hate is something that, that ruins. Another category where, where people have issues with, and I call this the father wound. The father wound. Maybe your father abandoned you. Maybe you don't even know who your father is. And this has played a huge and significant role in who you are today. And you carry around these pains and you don't know how to deal with it. You're carrying around these, these chains and, and you, you have no idea what to do. Here's another wound. This is one that causes a lot of hate in people. We go, well, you cheated on me. 
Well, you left the kids. Well, you did this. Well, you did that. And people begin to hate each other, hate each other. Maybe you've been betrayed by somebody in your family. Maybe they've said something, they did something, or they didn't do something, that you carry around that deep, deep wound, and you just are harboring, you're harboring this anger, you're harboring this hate, and it's controlling you. You can't move on because you just have so much hate. This is the kind of person that gets angry about everything. This is the kind of person that struggles to forgive. The third thing that you need to know to break the chains is you've got to act. You've got to take action. You see, it's one thing to pray. It's one thing to have faith. But are you actually going to take the step of faith and do something about it? Now, notice in the story that we read, okay, they're, they're praying for, for Peter's release, and then, uh, you know, well, they, they, have this, they miss this faith opportunity, and then he's there, and then Peter is hitting the door. Let me in. What did they have to do? Open the door. This is where a lot of us stop. You go, okay, I'll pray, I'll believe. But when it comes to it, we're not willing to take the net necessary steps to get there. Let me give you an example. People say, hey, can you pray for me? Can, can you pray with me to help me find a job or, or you know, to, to help me find something better employment-wise? And Yeah, I'll pray with you. And yes, I'm believing. I'm believing that God's going to give you a job that you love, that it's just is right up your, your alley. It's just going to be phenomenal for you. But they never act. They never go to an interview. They never get an application. They never look. Now, sometimes we got to act. We got to take steps. We got to do something about this. It's not just about praying. It's not just about faith. But we need to do what the Lord tells us. So if you're somebody that struggles with addiction, what are the actions that you, you could take? Well, first of all, you got to admit that you got a problem. Whether that's video games or whether that's alcohol, you got to admit that you got a problem. You got to find some people that that you can surround yourself with that are going to help you, that are going to encourage you. You need to remove temptation. Okay? And you need to get yourself in into something. We have a fantastic uh, program here called Celebrate Recovery. I would encourage you to be a part of that. They're a great group of people. They will welcome you in. It's a safe place to be. When I first became a youth pastor about nine or ten years ago, the very first youth convention I ever went to as a youth pastor, um, I took a few kids, and one of the girls that had come, she was really, really struggling. She had the epitome of a dysfunctional family. Um, Her mom had died. Her... Her dad was alcoholic, doing drugs, those kind of things. Mom was, stepmom was abusive. Just a really bad situation. While we were there at youth convention, this, this teenager tried to overdose on, on like Advil, right? Like took a whole bottle of Advil. We found this out and we're trying to talk like, hey, what's going on? And, and come to find out like she was really addicted to things. She was literally drinking alcohol every day in school, and no one had ever caught her. And what she would do is she would go buy those those dark-colored plastic bottles, like a root beer kind of bottle, and she would put alcohol in it and drink that all day, and no one would know. She was literally trying to just escape the issues. She she was doing drugs. She was doing all kinds of stuff. She was sleeping with people, whatever she could do to get away. So when we started finding these things out, started praying with her, started saying, okay, how, you know, let's help you, let's believe. And, and come to find out, 
the cause of all these issues was that her mom had committed suicide. And she thought she was the person, she thought she was responsible. So we worked with her and, and help her. And I remember the day she came into my office and, and she came in there, she had a bag of weed and she had her bong right there. She said, Pastor Nick, I'm going to give this up. And she gave it. You see, if there's some sort of an addiction, you've got to take the action steps. You've got to give it up. You've got to be able to move on. If you're the person that's, that's going through the financial issues, right, the guru on this is Dave Ramsey, right? You know why Dave Ramsey is the guru on this? Because he was in financial ruin himself, if you've ever heard his story. He had just gotten married, and, and he thought, okay, yeah, we've, we've got to buy a house. We've got to have a house. They couldn't afford the house. Oh, we've got to buy a car. Well, they couldn't afford the car. And they started getting all these bills which they could not afford. Studies show us that most newlyweds within like three to five years try to accumulate the wealth or all the possessions that their parents had that took them like 30 years to get. So he was drowning in debt, and so he was sick of it, and he had to start to figure out a way to get out of it. The first step is he said, you got to cut up those credit cards. Cut up those credit cards. Don't buy anything that you can't have cash for. Then he said, you, you, excuse me. He said that you've got to cut up and, and move on in life. He said that you've got to start selling off stuff. How many of you have Craigslist or eBay? You know, a lot of us have junk in our house that someone else would buy. And if you start selling off that junk, that's going to help you pay down some of that debt, help you pay down some of those bills, okay? The other thing that he, he wanted to do is, is he needed to make more income. Now, some of you are in a job where you can't work more hours. So maybe you got to get a, a part-time job on the side. Now, look, nobody wants to get a part-time job, right? But you have to be able to work hard. It may be doing something that you don't even want to. He tells this story where uh, a person went to their pastor and said, man, I don't know how I'm ever going to get out of this debt. And, and he said, okay, I want you to go and I want you to buy a leaf blower. So he buys the leaf blower and he says, you see that community over there? I want you to go up there. Those are, that's where the wealthy people live. And I want you to go up there because those wealthy people are scared of their leaves. Just go up there and tell them that they can pay you money and you will blow those scary leaves away. So this is what this guy does. Now, is that a fun job? You know, is it a fun job delivering pizzas? Is it a fun job doing these other things? No. But when you want to get out of debt, you got to be willing to work hard. I'll be very honest with you. When my son Dominic was born, we were living on, a, on one income, and we were struggling. We were struggling. Now, if you've ever had a child, you know babies are expensive, right? We didn't have anything. We didn't have the furniture. We didn't have the clothes, the diapers, anything. And so what do we do? Okay, well, we're going to put it on the credit card. And then you get the hospital bill, and you're like, oh, Lord Jesus, please help us. Right? You, 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 you start putting these things on a credit card. And within a matter of like two or three months, we had $5,000 on this credit card. And I was never a person that had anything on a credit card. So... And I, and I don't like to say this, but my wife, less than two weeks after having a C-section, is out trying to get a job. She's going to high school. She's going to an interview to, to try to get a teaching job. She was doing that because we're trying to get out of debt. We're trying to, 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 to be how God has called us to be, to live within our means, all those things. Sometimes it's hard work. It's hard work, and you've got to be willing to do the hard work. And the last thing Dave Ramsey says is you better be praying. You've got to be praying. Pray for God's provision. Pray for, for those miracles to take place. And when God tells you to do something, you need to act on that. The last category that we had talked about is hate. Hate. If you are someone that struggles with hate, I have a very powerful word for you that will revolutionize your life. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgive those people that have hurt you. Forgive that father or mother who was never there. 
forgive those, those, those loved ones that betrayed you or abused you or, or whatever it was. Forgiveness. You see, we, we live in a world today where so many people are just bitter. They had so many things happen to them and, and they don't know how to let go. And so they carry around these chains and they are just trying to pull thousands of pounds of weight behind them because they're not willing to forgive. And you go, well, Pastor Nick, but, but that person never said they were sorry. That person never did this. Well, I'm telling you, they don't have to say sorry, but you need to forgive. If Jesus can forgive you, he can forgive me, right? You see, you got to remember we're not perfect. We've all made mistakes. We've all done things. And thank the Lord that Jesus forgave us. So we should at least be willing to extend that to others and forgive other people. As we're wrapping up here today, I'm going to ask that you would take out your, your connection card. On there, you'll, you'll uh, see some information on there. Remember, you can mark the Italy trip there if you want some more information. Write it in on there. On that little connection uh, announcement page, you'll, you'll find our, our memory verse, which is be joyful in hope, patient in affliction faithful in prayer. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Now look, I've been talking to you about these chains. How do we break these chains off? If you have a literal chain, you have to apply tension. You have to apply force. You have to apply something that is stronger than the chain itself to, to break it, right? Well, we have that. It's called Jesus. We have that. It's called God. We have that. It's called the Holy Spirit. What we need to do is we need to apply the force, and we need to take off the chains that are holding us back. We need to let those things go from our lives. Stop carrying around the weight. Stop being restricted. Stop being a prisoner to those things. And allow God to come in and allow God to work and do what God tells you to do. And I promise you that you will become free of those chains. You will become free of those burdens. You got to pray. You got to have faith. And you got to act. You got to act. I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes here for a second. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Nick, I've never asked Jesus into my heart today. That is the first step. That is the first step for those chains to be broken off of your life, whether it's addiction, whether it's the financial stuff, whether it's the hate stuff. If you've never asked Jesus in, that is the very first step that you've got to ask the Lord in to come in and forgive you, make you clean, make you a new person, give you a hope, give you a destiny, give you a future. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Nick, I want to give my heart to the Lord. If that's you, I ask that you would raise your hand. I see your hand, little buddy. Anybody else? Yes, I see your hands. Is there anybody else? Lord, we thank you for the hands that are raised. We thank you, Lord, for those who are willing to give their hearts to you, to say, Lord, come in. Forgive me. Give me a new life. Help me to live for you to the best of my ability. Help me break off those chains, Lord. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Nick, I'm struggling with one of those addictions. Or maybe it's not even one of those addictions I mentioned. Maybe it's something else. Now here, I, I understand this is a touchy subject. People don't want to admit but you can't move on, you can't break the chains until you're willing to admit. If you're here today and that you, you would say, I'm struggling with some sort of addiction, would you please raise your hand? This isn't a room full of shame. This is a, a room of, of love. This isn't a room of judgment. Yes, we see your hands all over this room. I appreciate your honesty. You can put your hands down. Maybe you're here today and you would say, Pastor Nick, I'm somebody that struggles with the chains of the financial burdens. If that's you, I ask that you would raise your hand. 
yes, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate your honesty. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Nick, I am struggling with hate. I'm struggling with anger. And I want to be free from that. If that's you, I ask that you would raise your hand. Yeah, it's a lot of hands. If you can put your hands down. In a few moments, we're going to give you opportunity to come up here. If you raise your hand, I encourage you to come to this altar. I encourage you to come before your, your creator and just cry out to him. Say, God, how do we break these chains? And let the work begin here. The worship team's going to play a couple of songs here. I encourage you to just come and, and be before the Lord. Would you all pray after me? Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Those bad things that I was doing. Help me to change those things. Help me to live for you. Those chains that I was carrying. We release them. In Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you, congregation, take a few moments, get before your creator here and worship him and cry out and let him do the work on your soul. There is power. Every chain, break every chain. He's the awesome. 